Well, I mean, might as well. Caitlin Clark, they got their ass beat last night. But, man, Charles Barkley said this a couple days ago that the WNBA could not have effed this up more. Kathy Engelbert, who is the commissioner, is facing criticism from members of the Players Association for not condemning racism and homophobia, which was, of course, inevitable and inevitably tied back to Caitlin Clark. What? Let's hear from it. Now it seems on some social media channels to have taken a darker turn, a more menacing turn, where race has been introduced into the conversation, where sexuality is sometimes introduced into the conversation. How do you try and stay ahead of that, uh, try and tamp it down or, or act as a league when two of your most visible players are involved, n- not personally it would seem, but their fan bases are involved in saying some very uncharitable things well, about the other. Well, the one other. thing that's great about the league right now, we do sit at this intersection of, of culture and sport and fashion and music. Like the WNBA players are really looked at now as kind of cultural icons. True. And when you have that, you oh, have boy. a lot of attention on you. There's no more apathy. Everybody cares. It is a little that bird magic moment, if you recall, from 1979 when those two rookies came in from a big college rivalry, one white, one black. And so we have that moment with these two. But the one thing I know about sports, you need rivalry. That's what makes people watch. They want to watch games of consequence between rivals. They don't want everybody being nice to one another. So social media is different today than it was in 1979 when it didn't exist. Um, But, you know, I always tell the players, you know, I was told a long time ago, if someone's typing something in and you wouldn't ask their advice, ignore it. All right, let me go through this then. So Awful Announcing, which is run by a fat little guy named Little Benny Coop. They're the worst human beings in media. All right, they're the worst. Little Benny Axelrod, they are so fun. They're left to Pelosi, if it's possible. I didn't think it is. But anytime you don't kiss their ass. So Awful Announcing at one point had a thing. They were interesting. Now they've moved so far left, and basically what they've done, uh, little Benny Koo, the the, uh, owner, I guess, is he has decided they're going to be at the forefront of everything insanely liberal. And they show it every time. That answer was fine. There's nothing wrong with that answer. The guy asking the question is about three months too late on CNBC asking the question. Like, it's gone. It's over. It's sports. You know, I don't know if white, fat, middle-aged guy there ever played or was in a locker room, but dudes on the court, particularly black, African-American dudes being racist towards white people, white basketball players, is like Monday. Effing white boy. That kind of thing. You even see it in the media. Guys do it. All right? So this guy is is like years late. He's also relative to the WNBA, kind of months late, fine. She answered the question, fine. And she's going to be, as I go through the criticism here, shown to be really weak and really stupid. You don't answer to awful announcing. You make fun of awful announcing. You don't answer to the Players Association criticize you answered them in private. Awful announcing said her response was not only lackluster. Oh, really? It lacked of any substance. Well, so what? She's right. This is months ago, you idiots, at awful announcing. I mean, what are you talking about? Engelbert's word salad reply reminded me of a politician being asked a specific question, then dodging it all together. You know, awful announcing wants to get into politics. We've got the biggest word salad dumbass and now proven to be complicit liar with ABC in Kamala Harris, Kamala, whatever the hell her name is. And awful announcing doesn't say jack squat about it. So shut up. Uh, It would fit. Oh, wait a second. Had she been asked about the way the league is thriving in its current state, it would fit. Engelbert's casual dismissal of social media is equivalent to an adult telling the child who is getting bullied to simply ignore the comments. Oh, shut up. Just shut up. 
She's talking publicly, privately. I know the. This is where awful announcing is just idiotic. They don't have anybody that actually knows. I talk to Lynn Dunn, the general manager of the Fever, every day. And the league has taken great steps. I'll defend Kathy Engelbert here. The league has taken great steps because the African-American lesbian players were going overboard in their racism and sexism on Caitlin Clark. Lynn and the WNBA had to send different videos at all to the league to get this crap to stop. And the league has, for the most part, stopped it. These are still human beings. You're not going to stop everything. Awful announcing doesn't know this. They're trying to pander. All right? Uh, Unwilling to see the full effects of the emotional and mental damage that is being done. I don't think Engelbert is that naive. Who's emotional and mental damage? Who's me? It doesn't seem like Caitlin Clark's being emotionally damaged. Doesn't seem like Angel Reese is being emotionally damaged. And let's go back to Caitlin Clark. She's the one facing all of it. See, she's the one facing it. Okay, now let's go the other way. From the players, you're going to tell me that players are facing it on social media. Really? Welcome to the real world. Welcome to 2024. Really? People now criticize Donald Trump for getting shot in the head. Don Lemon just deleted a video of him criticizing Donald Trump's wife, Melania Trump, because she wanted answers to her husband getting, wait for it, shot in the head. Let me say that again. The ear part of the head. I mean, if we're going to criticize the president, former president of the United States for getting shot in the head, we're certainly going to criticize a bunch of women throwing up air balls, missing from two feet, and dribbling off their ass. I mean, just stop. Equal but special is what we're talking about here That's what awful announcing wants. There's no mental strain on social media unless you allow it. Turn it off. You don't have it. Just stop. I mean, again, here's the thing. Let me equate this to Donald Trump. Have you heard Donald Trump, excuse me, ever claim victim status for doing what? Getting shot in the head. But all these little girls who are now in the WNBA, who want to be treated like NBA players, who, by the way, get criticized for everything. LeBron James can play a basketball game, and you can make the argument he's the greatest, second greatest, whatever you want to make, and everything he does gets criticized, yet everybody wants to be paid the same. Shut up. Honest to God. Here's the Players Association. Here's the answer the commissioner should have. Oh, boy. All right. The WNBA is now telling the commissioner how she should have answered. To be very clear regarding the racism, misogyny, and harassment experienced by our players, there's absolutely no place in sports for it. Of course there is. I'm not condoning it. I mean, you can say there's no place, but it's here. If you play professional sports or you are me and you are on television, streaming, radio, doesn't matter. You're going to get criticized. And it doesn't matter if somebody says there's no place for it. Let me explain this to you. The hate, WNBA Players Association, the sexism, the harassment came from your own players, came from your own coach, your Olympic coach with the, it's not about one player, came from your own player cheap shotting, knocking down, and then Angel Reese and others celebrating, knocking over a little white girl, which is what they call Caitlin Clark. So just stop putting it on others. This was started and exacerbated by the Players Association. And if Lynn Dunn, the general manager of the Fever, didn't send a number of videos to the league office, it would probably be still going on. You started it. You're the ones that did it. You're the ones that condoned it. You're the ones that perpetuated it. I'm sorry. 
of course hate, racist, a homophobic, misogynist shouldn't happen. But they do. And you all perpetuated it. It's not about rivalries, iconic personalities, fueling a business model. This kind of toxic fandom should never be tolerated or left unchecked. It demands immediate action. Frankly, should have been addressed years ago. Terry Jackson. Well, Terry Jackson, it was addressed because it was your own African-American lesbian players. Look, I live by Dr. Martin Luther King's mantra. Always have, always will. Taught it by my dad. Judge folks on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. So you can get mad at me for saying angry, lesbian, African-American women, but that's who was doing this. And that's who perpetuated this. And now you're mad about it when you didn't do jack shit to stop it? Nothing. You didn't mind when Angel Reese celebrated Caitlin Clark getting knocked over. You didn't mind any of You didn't mind. Uh, and I know uh, McAfee misspoke, should not have said that, but you didn't mind when that's what they were calling Caitlin Clark a white biatch. You didn't mind that. You didn't. Well, if you minded it, then you didn't do anything about it. To the point where the general manager of the Indiana Fever had to do something about it. And the league did something about it. And now you're crying about it? Beautiful. Of course all that shouldn't be in sports. But I got a flash for you. It is. You see what happened to Daniel Jones walking outside after a game? Stand on the rail if you think it's just you guys. Welcome to the big leagues. Stand on the rail at a horse track. Watch how people react to the jockey as they come by after the race to go back to the paddock, at least at at, uh, uh, my place, Indiana uh, Indiana Grand, racing and casino up here. Watch how the jockey is treated. It's here. Yeah, you can condone it all you want. You can do whatever you want. But it ain't stopping. Why didn't you stop it? Players Association, why didn't you go about the business? Why did a general manager have to stop it? Why didn't you tell coaches, why are you being divisive with it's not one woman? Of course, why? You guys are always victims, you WNBA players. I go back to Donald Trump. He got shot in the head. He ain't a victim. So, You know what happened. Kathy Engelbert wants to keep her job. During a recent interview, I was asked about the dark side of social media and online conversation about WNBA rivalries and race. To be clear, there's absolutely no place for hate or racism of any kind in WNBA or anywhere else. Yeah, but you weren't doing anything about it. You weren't doing a damn thing about it. None of you were. None of you. Until Lynn Dunn did. Until the Indiana Fever did. Hell, you were celebrating it. You know, in a way, you were encouraging it with all the idiots, all the old school, white, black, straight, lesbian, the old school women of the WNBA with the hashtag, more than one woman. You were celebrating it. You encouraged it. You encouraged the hate, the violence on the court. You talked about how this is an incredibly physical league, blah, 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 blah. Oh, and now you're mad about it. Good for you. Frauds. Absolute frauds. Speaking of frauds, while I'm on one here, speaking of frauds, um, Charles Barkley called out the frauds that are the media on the Tyreek Hill case. You know how this was going. You had to. You absolutely had to. White dudes, and I mean, you saw Ian Rappaport. Oh, my God. Now, I've been had a gun to my head. You know, three times I've had a gun pulled on me by a cop. I'm guessing Ian Rappaport grew up in, you know, a neighborhood or act that he didn't have that. I did. I understand. It happens to white dudes when you don't acquiesce to what police want, just like it happens to black dudes. But I will say this happens more to African-Americans. That stuff is real. Everybody that I know that's African-American will tell you that it's real. And I get it. But we can only go by our life experiences. And I understand as a middle-aged white guy, I'm really not allowed to share my life experiences. But screw you, I got a show, so I do. Charles Barkley, he knew what was coming. He knew it, I knew it, you knew it. You knew that all the grifters out there, the Bamani Jones, the Jamel Hills, you knew that all of them would be out there with their nonsense. This is an opportunity, they're for sale. Barkley uh, tapped it down. 
Barkley called out the media. I hate when we're going to throw it in the media because you know the guys are going to quickly go to race, and that bothers me. We got so many fools in the media who love to play the race card. I said, wait a minute. They just did the same thing to Scotty Scheffler. Wait a minute. Same thing just happened to Scotty Scheffler, who actually went and got booked. He went down to the big house. That's right. That's what I'm saying. Tyreek Hill acted like a dumbass. I would argue, you will disagree, that Scotty Scheffler acted like a dumbass. Help. Tyreek Hill said, what if my name wasn't Tyreek Hill? Well, if your name was Dan Dockage, at least in three, the three instances where either myself or an, a passenger in my car acted like a jackass, if you weren't Tyreek Hill and you were Dan Dockage, you got a gun pointed at you. Once to the chest, once cold steel right there, touching my head. And the other time just drawn on me from about me to the camera. That's what would happen if you weren't Tyreek Hill. Hell, you're Tyreek Hill. You got to go play a game, score an 80-yard touchdown, mock the police, and collect a big-ass game check. When I had Colt Steele put to my head, and what I do, and this is bad, this is not, and the cop said, what are you laughing about? I, I just do. When I get threatened, I laugh. I just start laughing. Don't know why. Always have. I said, I just nervous habit. And I looked at his finger hoping he wasn't going to pull no trigger. That's what happens if you're Dan Dockage. I don't know. I can't tell you what else. I don't know what happens anywhere else. But we all know that the racist, uh, the racist media is going to lose their mind. So let's continue. The one thing you can't do as a celebrity, you can't say, do you know who I am? You say, yes, sir. And let me explain again. White dudes in my neighborhood had this talk. White dudes in Northwest Indiana, Maribel, Gary, we had this talk, but one thing was added. When you come to a stoplight or any kind of situation where there could be a car in front and a car behind, give yourself room to get the hell out of there so you don't get jacked. That, my friends, came from my father, who was a principal in Gary, Indiana, and a driver's ed instructor. And to this day on Stony Island, and anywhere else, actually, whenever I go to a Cubs game and I get off because the fastest way to Wrigley is Stony Island, guess what? I leave room. Give me this crap. But when all these fools on TV and radio start talking about it, they go straight to, was it racism? I'm like, wait a minute. They don't know that. I saw the police report say he was uncooperative. Well, I saw the camera that was uncooperative. Hey, look, man, like I said, when Dan Dockage was uncooperative, one time I spit on a cop's shoes, one time I passed, and I wouldn't pull over until he showed me a badge. All right. I got the gun to the head. I didn't see a gun to the head of Tyreek Hill. Now, I think I'd rather have a gun to the head than put on face down on the ground with my hands behind because, well, face down on the ground with my hands behind, I didn't like it. I tried it the other day. I got a big hernia right here, a split of my muscle that pops out. It's not fun. Ah. <sighs> Mike Wilbon says he doesn't have any question on the matter because he's driven while black long enough to know that's why police acted the way they did towards the Miami Star. Blame racism. Here's Wilbon. Wilbon, what questions does it raise in your mind? I don't have any questions. I don't have any questions. I'm, I'm old enough and have lived long enough and have driven while black long enough. I don't have any questions. The police acted with excessive force. I don't, I don't need anybody to tell me to say allegedly. No, we got the video. They reacted in excessive ways from 1 through 10, from A through Z. Having said that, more than one thing can be true. If Tyreek Hill rolls down his window, he might have diminished the chances of that happening. I say might because when you're driving while black, DWB as we call it, you don't have to provoke police, particularly in certain places, to get dragged out of your car. So he might have gotten dragged out anyway. But yep. he did not attempt to mitigate those circumstances by lowering his window, which goes to a conversation many of us have to have now with our 16-year-old sons about what happens when the police stop you driving while black. So more than one thing can be true, and I think that is absolutely the case here. There you go. Yeah. You I don't disagree with what Will Bond's saying. I'm sure driving while black does, but I'm just telling you, uh, when you go about the business of not cooperating, things are going to happen. And don't give me that. Hey, look, we all, I had a conversation with my son. 
hands on the dash, roll down the window, ask if you can go into your glove box to get a damn uh, registration license if the cops are pulling up and you can get the registration license out before the insurance and the registration do it. Yeah, I get it. I do. Uh, Will Bond's right. But Will Bond is being, he's trying hard. He sees Stephen A. Smith. He's trying hard here. But I got to tell you, I'll answer your question. What if I wasn't Tyreek Hill? Well, I was Dan Dockage, and I got gun pulled on me three times. One, two, three. Uh, Stephen A. Smith thinks that Swift, Taylor Swift's endorsement, was perfectly timed, insinuating that the pop star's endorsement of Harris came as some sort of surprise. What? Are you crazy in reality? Uh, Swift going to bat for Harris is something that was always going to happen. It's just a matter of when, not if. Uh, talk about gaining momentum. Taylor Swift timed this perfectly, revealing her endorsement right after the debate. Two million likes, 21 minutes. Trump wasn't in trouble. He sure is now. He certainly should want a second debate. I saw where Trump said, I don't want a second debate. And I won the first debate. Yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, Stephen A. also, of course, thinks that, well, Americans are idiots. Uh, that Taylor Swift's endorsement matter. It does. I mean, Ty is going to go to young women that don't really pay attention, that said, well, Taylor likes her. I mean, it is. Stephen A. Smith's a multimillionaire living in a Disney bubble who has very little interaction with normal Americans, zero communication with middle America. He's a celebrity. Therefore, he thinks a, fair, a fellow celebrity carries more influence than they actually do. It should also go without saying that of the 283 million followers Swift shared her pro Camilla post with, Large number of those people and bots do not live in the United States. If they do, plenty of them aren't of age to vote. We can call that nitpicky, but it's a fact that those like Swift making this or Smith making the Swift endorsement a bigger deal than it is. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's a big deal. <laughs> I do, but I live in a weird world. Hey, Nick, that a big deal? I mean, you're a young guy. Is it a big deal that's that uh, Taylor Swift endorsed uh, Kamala Harris? I think it's a big deal, yeah, but I also think that the amount of followers that she has, most of them are probably already like left leaning to begin with. I don't think there's a lot of people. Maybe like maybe ninety percent of her followers are probably, you know, liberal, ten percent aren't. And you have to also probably think that a majority of them probably aren't able to vote. A lot of them are from across the you know, across the pond. So I do think it matters, sure. Like, what does Trump have? Hulk Hogan? Okay. He's cool, but, like, Taylor Swift has 284 million followers on, <laughs> on, on Instagram. That's a big deal. That's a good, that's a good, good point. Uh, I got in trouble at ESPN. It became a national story. Resident creeper Greg Doyle, apparently. Uh, what, Dana Bembao Hunzinger of the star here? Danny Wolken of the... USA Today, Chris Corman of something, I don't know what the hell he writes for, and a bunch of others awful announcing came at me because I defended my marriage. I said I would not go at it in a pool with a woman named Joanna Mellis, a professor somewhere, don't know, who wanted to, quote, go at it with me in the pool. And the reason I said absolutely no is because I didn't want any ambiguity. I knew what she was talking about. But to protect my wife, my marriage from any embarrassment, and it sounds stupid, but when I was a single man, I had women throwing themselves at me left and right. I did. I had a job. I was popular. I was visual out in the greater Indianapolis community. And once I decided I was getting married and Lee decided she was going to marry me, I wanted to make sure that never was there any ambiguity to my feelings relative to my wife or my marriage. So I said, nope, ain't doing it. Ain't putting my marriage in trouble by going at it in the pool. Of course, the writers, they like it a little freaky, apparently, because I have not heard from one of those about this. <laughs> Shannon Sharp somehow, some way, decided to go on Instagram Live and put a sex tape out of himself. Then, of course, he got hacked. I wonder what Stephanie Drooley, Jimmy Patero, the heads of ESPN are doing. They can't do anything. Shan Sharp's black. You ain't firing him. Are you crazy? And more so, he's got the endorsement of Stephen A. Smith. 
What have these white folks in Building 4 shown? I'll tell you what they've shown. No spine. I remember getting a call from Stephanie Drooley, who's a vice president. Dan, the women of ESPN are very upset. I go, the women of ESPN are upset. You're a football writer who's married with two kids is having an affair with Greg Doyle, who's married with two kids, the writer from Indianapolis. What are you talking about? Who's upset? I don't care if they're upset. What do I care? Crickets on this. Huh. Here's Shannon Sharp explaining that not only did somehow, some way, and I got to get Nick's input on this in a minute, somehow, some way did he go on Instagram Live, but then he lied about it saying he was hacked, which I don't blame him. Here he is, this idiot. I'm very disappointed in myself. Um, not oh, for the really? act. Um, I think there are millions and billions of people uh, of consenting age that engage in activities. Um, but but to have your most intimate detail on the audio to be heard, I'm disappointed in myself. I let them call them. I called my sister. Uh, my friends, obviously, my friends reached out. But, guys, this was not staged. Came in. I threw my phone on the bed. Um, gazed in an activity. I did not know IG Live. I've never been on IG Live. I've never turned IG Live on. So I don't know how it works. What a bullshitting fool. <laughs> oh, man. Nick, talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. What's going on I here? Imagine, I cannot imagine he did that accidentally. Only because like, there's a bunch of steps that you have to go through. To, like, are you sure you want to go live on Instagram? Like, are you sure you like, and then you got to click yes. And then it takes you to, you know, the camera roll and then you start recording. Plus he was like, you were able to see like his floor or something or like his ceiling. So obviously one camera was flipped one way or another. I don't know. He said he flipped, threw his phone on the bed. I cannot imagine my man Shannon was just like, yeah, no, this, this happened on accident. It seems kind of flaky. I, I, he handled it professionally. That's for damn sure. I was very surprised at his answer. He he owned it right away. I was like, damn, okay. But I cannot imagine this was accidental. There is a, there's a bunch of steps that you have to take. Really? I, I have no I don't yeah. know what Instagram live. I know what Instagram is. I really don't go on. I go on it to like stuff or or uh add stuff to my story that that outkick puts. Hey Stephanie Drooly, Jimmy Patero. We're going to give this man a raise? Awful announcing. Let's talk about how great he is. Oh, man. Are you better? You better. Or Jamel Hill or Bramani Jones. They're going to come at you, awful announcing. Little Benny Koo. <laughs> I get a kick out of this stuff. I do. Uh, I, 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 I. You know, I absolutely love it. So what do you think actually happened here? What, what do you think happened? Maybe like okay, so if it's if he if he wasn't bullshitting and it was it didn't happen on accident, maybe there were maybe you know it started out a little too nitty gritty and then the phone like he didn't realize got in between like his elbow and like the the, the sheets and maybe like you know it scratched the touch screen and he did end up going to Instagram. Maybe he accidentally like left it unlocked, the phone unlocked, and then he went to Instagram and it actually happened. Sure. Or maybe, you know, he, you know, if he, if he was, if he's bullshit and he actually didn't do it on, like, accidentally he did it on purpose, then maybe he did it on the side when she wasn't looking. So the only two things that I could say. But, like, I don't think he but wants what? anybody's. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I don't think he wants no, anybody, ahead. like, he wants um, his personal life out there like that. I don't think he wants anybody. You know, knowing like you know what he does, you know, in the privacy of his own home. That's 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 my thing because I know I know I wouldn't, um, and I, like anybody, any reasonable man probably wouldn't want that. I don't think so easy uh, either, yeah. right? Uh... <laughs> it's funny though. I, I, it is I, funny. And, uh... I saw a tweet yesterday about it. Saying like you know we're not posting the video for obvious reason. I thought it was fake. I thought it was just some clickbait, you know, BS. And then I did too. Not follow. I a, fo a follow up tweet came out like an hour later with the actual video. I was just like, is this dubbed? There's no way this can be real. And then Shannon's apology came out. I was like, oh, that's real, real. That's legit, real. 
Love it. Oh, man. I mean, I have an axe to grind with ESPN because I remember sitting there telling my wife, reading this stuff about me, going, man, I said I wouldn't go in a pool. I had some writer in Philadelphia call it rapey. My sister's a prosecutor. She goes, it's the opposite of rapey. You said you would not go in. <laughs> oh, TV exec Berkey Magnus says in a perfect world, Charles Barkley would be part of ESPNN, though knowing Barkley has made it known on multiple occasions, he's going to stay with TNT. Here he is. In a perfect world, could you see Charles Barkley uh, with ESPN? Yeah, yeah. That would be a perfect world, actually. <laughs> um, no, I, like uh, Charles is a singular talent. Um, you know, again, I think this season is going to be a little bit of a bridge to the future, both for us and for the, you know, the NBA and for uh, for Turner and, and, and NBC getting into the, into the mix and Amazon getting into the mix going forward. So, um, you know, I, I, I would be lying if, we, if I said we weren't interested in Charles. I think the entire industry is interested in Charles. Um, he's really that special. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. i tell you what, ESPN, man, you put a sex tape out, you can work. Why wouldn't you work there? What do you think it, what do you think it takes for Shannon Sharp to get fired? I mean, I put a sex tape. Oh, my God. Oh, man. Oh, okay. All right. I'm with Dan Lebertard on something. I'm going to say it right now. I'm with Dan Lebertard on something. I'm a conspiracy theorist sometimes, and I don't necessarily believe in coincidence but the fat one is floating a conspiracy theory that the C Cleveland Browns leaked Deshaun Watson's latest sexual assault allegations in an attempt to get out of paying for his fully guaranteed contract. Yeah. Timing is interesting here. The number of people who will defend this behavior, if you think their quarterback is good, and then the strategic leaking of stuff that makes you wonder. They're trying to get out from under this contract. I wondered the same thing. It's pretty gross. Finances of this are so cold and awful, they're now like, yo, the Browns are going to try and see if they can sneak away from everything there when they shouldn't be able to. No, 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 no. They should be able to. No, no. Oh, no. In a world of Dan Lebertard. In the world of Mina Kimes, in the world of victimhood, they shouldn't be able to. In the world of business, they absolutely should be able to. And that's why that got leaked when it did, in my opinion. Look, I don't believe in coincidences like this. The guy plays awful. I mean, historically bad. He's been historically bad. And all of a sudden, the from 2020, which by the way, 2020 is now kind of a long time ago. I mean, not that long, but you know, hey, I got this thing here. I got this story. Hang on to it. Let's see if we need something. Now, I was talking to a, a Chad Withrow from Hot Mike yesterday on my afternoon show. And the guy that's the attorney for all the victims, Busby, he's clever like that, yo. He's devious like that, yo. He wants to win that bad, yo, that he, I could see, not saying he did, total conspiracy theory here, would go to the Browns, say, you got a problem with your quarterback, you got a problem with the contract, here's what I got, work with me. You know what I'm saying? Now, does that make total sense? Maybe not. But I'm giving you the shell. I'm giving you the outline. I'm not giving you the stuffing. I'm giving you the peppers. I'm not giving you the sarma, the sausage inside the stuffed peppers. You know what I'm saying? I'm not really giving you that. But you get my point. Don't ever, never, ever. I have family. My brother was a prosecutor and a defense attorney in different ways. My good friend, the great Freddie Vianna, prosecutor, or excuse me, I'm sorry, defense attorney to the stars here in Indy. People are smart. Deals are made. In fact, I'm going to have Freddie on my afternoon show now that I'm thinking about it to talk about this. It's interesting. 
it's even more interesting that I'm actually agreeing with the fat one. When fat Dan me agrees with fat Dan him, it's got to be true. It's got to be right. How could it not be? Hey, a former DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, program manager for the Phoenix Suns is suing the team for $60 million, claiming wrongful determination, citing ongoing racial discrimination and harassment, really. All right. Uh, a guy named Trishan was let go for her role after 10 months on the job. She seeks retribution with severe accusation against the team. Sun's response claimed that Trishan was let go for failing to perform the basic responsibilities of her job. She alleges she was subject to racist comments. Really? Shocking. Who didn't see that coming? While working for the Sun, specifically Ms. Trishan endured overt racist comments in a hostile work environment that went undressed despite being reported to HR and executive leadership. I got to tell you. Now, I've been in the corporate world for 15 years. That is not long compared to most. I was in the sports world before that for 25, 35, whatever it was. And I got to tell you, I have never, and I've worked with black folks, white folks, whatever. I've really never. I thought about this when I saw this story. I've never heard a racist comment directed at an employee in a professional business situation. I've heard racist comments delivered from player to player, mostly from black players towards white players. I've heard ra <clears throat> racial comments in locker rooms, but I've never heard, I've not one time, and Emma's a big company, ESPN a big company. I used to go there every week. Uh, what I'm at now, Cumulus, a big company, a lot of people there, black, white, whatever. Never heard one, not one. Now, I get it, I get it, It hap I'm white, but I, everybody doesn't know that I'm around. Everybody doesn't know where everybody is at all the time. I've never even overheard one, not one time. So I get all these DEI employees that are being fired. Man, maybe it's true. I'm just telling you again, my show, my experiences. You know, I talked about this off air with Coach Dungey just a second. Coach, when you had the clicker in your hand on NBC, honest to God, I, I've, I don't know if I've told you this before. It was must-see TV. We got to bring that back. Get the director. Let's go. What are we doing? Well, I'm, I would like to get it back, Dan. That was kind of my favorite segment of the show, too, when I could take a play and try to show the audience something that they might not notice. Here's what made this play go. Maybe it was a, an offensive lineman with a key block, or maybe it was just something else. But really point that out and slow it down. I, I love that. And – I had a number of women say, gosh, I really learned a lot during that segment. So that was always fun. Swear to God. Swear. A hand on the Bible. My wife said the same thing. My wife coached. <laughs> uh, she's, a, she's, a, she's a legend in the world of softball. She was All-American, mm -hmm. all-time winning as coach at Syracuse and all this. And we would watch that, and she goes, damn, I just learned something. That's, you know, and, and <laughs> I swear – Swear to God, that was anyway. Uh, yeah, I did, anyway, I'll, I'll get into other stuff. Hey, what, what, what? Give me this. I got to ask you a few things. Your reaction to the whole thing with Tyreek Hill, the arrest, the police, the whole deal. Well, um, it, it was unfortunate both ways. I don't think we can paint Tyreek as the absolute victim. Every year, Dan, first meeting I'd have with uh, our players. I'd list four or five things as if you avoid these things, you'll stay out of all kinds of problems, drugs and alcohol, uh, registered firearms, those kind of things, driving more than 30 miles an hour over the speed limit. If you avoid that, that's number one. And then number two, just roll your window down, give the man your license. I'm sure they would have said, oh, this is Tyreek Hill. We got to get him in the game. This is one of the Dolphins. Uh, but you know, was he wrong? Yes. And then were they wrong? Yes. But uh, somehow we could have avoided all of that by just following the rules. You know, it's funny. I grew up in Gary, Indiana, and I've had a gun put to my head three times by police officers. Uh, I've been stopped a lot. I go way too fast. But three times. And all three <laughs> times it was because I, <laughs> I was uncooperative. Uh, one time the cop was drunk. He was off duty, and I didn't really like that. 
But to your point, um, what do you think ultimately happens here? What 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 does I had, a, I had an attorney in Indianapolis, uh, one of Jimmy Voyles. I, I don't know if you know Jimmy. You probably mm-hmm. do. He's yeah. a defense attorney. One one of one of Jimmy's partners and I grew up together. He said, and take take me through this if you don't mind. He said um, that the NFL. You know, don't call your agent. Call NFL security. NFL really, really is involved in this type of thing once somebody gets stopped or pulled over. Is that your experience? Yes. They have a meeting with all the players at the beginning of the, the training camp, and they tell them that. And they give them the number. They give them a card. If you have any problems, any incidents, call this number. Uh, I'm sure Tyreek's agent, Drew Rosenhaus, called that number after Tyreek called him. Uh, but they, they want to be there to de-escalate these type of situations. Coach, I want to go. You've inspired me. I, I, I'm not going to lie. You, you've, you inspired me in this way. You have been very vocal about fathers in our communities, black communities, white communities. Hispanic, I don't care. You've been very, very vocal. And you caught a lot of crap about it, basically parroting in your own words, what Barack Obama had said earlier and other presidents had said earlier, but because I think because, you know, you seem to lean more conservative, you caught a lot of hell about it. But I want you to know, you inspired me. I talk about it because you talked about it. Um, What were your thoughts on the backlash towards Harrison Butker and what he had to say, you know, at a Catholic commencement? I I thought it was taken totally out of context. Uh, He's speaking to a particular group of people And what he said uh, really wasn't, how's the best way to put it? Um, If you listen to what he was saying, there wasn't anything to be offended by it. He said, a lot of these ladies are going to have great careers, but some of them and many of them might find that their most meaningful thing in life is parenting. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I've done a lot of things and got a a lot of accolades that uh, the world would put on you. And the most meaningful thing in my life has been parenting. So I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that. They probably didn't like the way he said it. And if it was directed, you know, to, uh, you know, cross-cultural audience, I I get all that. But he was speaking to a a very limited audience in a limited context. And I I thought it got taken way out out of context. Well, you, you, for whatever the reason, it's fascinating to me. Uh, you seem to be a villain, and I don't understand it, to the media. Like, it's, it's amazing to me. I, I don't get it. I don't understand it. Is it possible to say what Harrison Budker said in the, quote, right way? Um, I don't think there's necessarily a, a right way to say it for, for a lot of people. I, I'm a Christian. That's why I know that's why I take uh, heat and sometimes when you elicit those values and say, this is what the Bible says and this is what I stand on, if people don't believe in the Bible and they don't want to hear that, then they're going to be upset. Uh, But that's the way I talk. That's what I stand on. And I think Harrison's the same way. And so if you're talking about biblical principles, there's always going to be some people that get offended by that. And they say, keep that out of our sport. Keep that out of our politics. Keep your religious beliefs to yourself. And um, unfortunately uh, for them, I'm not going to do that. And so that comes across as being uh, unlikable sometimes. Yeah, I, I say this all the time, Coach. If Tony Dungy has become unlikable to the media, that's the media's problem. <laughs> that ain't a Tony Dungy problem. <laughs> that ain't. You know, the other thing you get criticized for, and, and I don't know how much you want to speak on this, is you're unapologetically pro-life. And... I, you know, that seems to be, I am as well, that seems to be something that not only causes controversy, but infuriates people just to simply talk in, in, in that manner. How frustrating, or is it frustrating for you uh, dealing with the criticism that you receive for a view like that? No, it's not really frustrating, Dan. And again, it goes with my uh, Christian beliefs. People now, today, they equate pro-life with anti-woman. And I'm not anti-woman at all. I believe that women uh, have rights. I believe that women should be protected if their health is in jeopardy. Absolutely. Get medical help. Do what needs to be done to save that woman's life to to get her out of a a problem situation. 
But I also, because I'm a Christian, I believe that that baby in the womb is a life. And I think that life should be protected as well. I think that that life has rights. And in this day and age, we can't, if, if you disagree with someone, then it, it becomes a problem. Instead of just saying, well, this, that's my opinion. You may not believe that. You may not think that. And I get it. If you don't believe that, okay. But that, this is just what I happen to believe. But if you say, well, I think that baby has rights and that baby has a life that needs to be protected, all of a sudden then you become a bad, bad person. And I went to the March for Life in Washington, D.C., and that offended a lot of people. And I'm sorry, but uh, that, that's just what I believe. You know, it, it, when do you think this started? I don't know how we've gotten to the point where if, if I don't affirm what you believe, uh, if I disagree with you, then all of a sudden that means I hate you. I don't respect you. Um, I, I don't know where that came from. Uh, and, and I think we need to, as a society, be able to say that. Hey, I need to express my opinion. I need to be able to listen to your opinion. And if I don't agree with it, to be able to say, hey, you know what? I don't agree with it, but you're still a good person. I still respect you. And let's move forward. We just disagree. And somehow we've lost that in our society. Full disclosure, I've been a Coach Dungy fan since he played as a quarterback. Uh, a lot of you do not remember that. <laughs> as a quarterback at the University of Minnesota, I, I have. I was always, you know, I look, uh, how do I put this without sounding disingenuous? I, I was always a quarter, a, a fan of Joe Gilliam, uh, uh, Harris okay. with the ra black quarterbacks. I'm just going to say it, Coach. I was always a fan going back in the 70s, and I could never understand. Like, I watch football, and I'm like, well, what are you talking about? Tony Dungy's great. Like, he's Offensive Player of the Year in the Big Ten. And Joe Gilliam, when he was battling Bradshaw and Hanrad, he, that yeah. dude's great. And James Harris, quarterback of the, of the Rams, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. That dude's great. Uh I thought you got screwed. I thought that whole group, there was a whole group of guys, uh, Stanley Jackson, maybe a little younger than you at Ohio State, but Ohio State, uh, Cornelius Jackson, I think was, I mean. Coach, Cornelius, Green. I, yeah. Cornelius, Cornelius Green, yeah. Cornelius Green. Cornelius Green. Cornelius Green, yes. I'll, yeah. I'll give you the guy, liked Dan, it. who was my hero, and you talk about getting unjustly, just not, not an opportunity, Chuck Ely was at University of Toledo. Chuck Ely never yes. lost a game in high school, quarterback in Ohio, goes to Toledo. Toledo had had a down program. He goes undefeated in three years at Toledo and doesn't get drafted. Uh, goes to the uh, Canadian Football League, wins the Grey Cup as a rookie, is the rookie of the year in Canada, had a tremendous career, but he was just ahead of his time. At, at that time, the NFL really didn't look outside the box. You had to be 6'4 and 230 and a pocket passer, and that's what they looked at as opposed to the guys who could move the chains and win the game. And that, that's where I think we've advanced now. Um, I tell my boys all the time who watch football now, and they are in love with Russell Wilson and Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes. Uh, we had some of those guys back in our day. They just didn't get the opportunity because the NFL didn't see outside the box back then and see what some of these guys like Chuck Ely could do. You tell them you were one of those guys. Uh, I try not to. I let other people <laughs> say that. <laughs> I'm serious. I wore my socks up to my knees when I played football. Uh, in the Sandlot in Gary, Indiana, because of you guys, because you guys always <laughs> had the high, the yeah, right, oh, yeah. always had the real high white yeah. socks, man. I, um, speaking of that, uh, you know, people here in Indy obviously love you. You do a lot of work here. Give me your thoughts on Anthony Richardson. Uh, what do you see? What is by the end of this year? Let me put it to you this way, Coach. By the end of this year, Anthony Richardson should be what as an NFL starting quarterback. I think he has a chance to be really, really good if he can perfect one thing, if he can start to hit those ordinary throws. Uh, he made a couple throws last week that nobody in, in the league can make. But then there's a couple where guys are open and he's got to just put the ball on the money and keep the drive going. And so he's making the spectacular play. 
But I go back, always go back to something my coach Chuck Knoll told us when I got to the Steelers. We had won two Super Bowls when I got there. And uh, he said, champions don't do the extraordinary things. Champions do ordinary things better than everyone else. And right now, to me, Anthony is making the extraordinary plays. And where he's got to get better is those ordinary down-in and down-out decisions and accurate throws. If he gets that part down, he's going to be a top-five quarterback. Coach, why are those throws so difficult to a guy, you know, that has good vision and a great arm? Why are those throws difficult? Uh, sometimes it's just timing and anticipation and doing the same thing over and over and over. And we have to understand, Anthony hasn't played a lot of football. You look at Bo Nix, uh, who's the rookie quarterback for Denver. Bo Nix played 60 college games, <laughs> you know, with all the COVID and transfer rules and all that and played a lot of football. Anthony is just scratching the surface. And, you know, you look at Peyton Manning year one, year two, to year 10 or year 12, great difference in just accuracy and timing and the little details. And, and that's going to come for Anthony. We just got to get him playing more football and doing it more and getting those reps in. Coach, last thing before I let you go, I, I, I've always thought this. There's a difference. You know, everybody gets to the pros is really good. But you mentioned Peyton Manning, and, and, and I'm curious your thought on this. Um, distractions, whether it's money, whether it's whatever, whatever distractions, um, particularly for a quarterback in the NFL, how important is it to maintain an almost like childlike love for the game despite millions, despite this, that, and all the other things? I always felt like Manning. I always heard how Manning was at Zionsville High School when I, you know, throwing in the morning yes. with – rookies that came you know that's that's what you probably did as a kid I know I did in basketball at five and six in the morning just because yep. I loved it how important is a childlike love for a guy making millions to uh, how to me Dan that's the key and that's what the great ones have you looked at Patrick Mahomes and and I've done a couple feature stories on him for NBC and you talk to anybody around their building talk to Andy Reid and it's that dedication. Yes, I've won three Super Bowls. Yes, I've been the MVP a couple of times, but I am still working in the offseason. I'm throwing every day, and I'm the first guy in the building in the morning that I'm looking at film and taking it home. And that's the way Peyton was. He would not let anybody out work. And my favorite Peyton Manning story, my last year coaching was 2008. And we've won, won a Super Bowl already. Peyton's been a three-time MVP. We drafted Anthony Gonzalez from Ohio State. And Ohio State, because of their school system, uh, they're still in, in school in June. So Anthony couldn't be with us in April and May in our off-season program. Well, two days a week after we practiced, Peyton would get in his car, drive from Indy to Columbus, three hours, take the playbook and some balls, Sit, uh, to sit down with Anthony, go over things for an hour or so, go out there and throw for 45 minutes, get him acclimated, and then drive back. About seven and a half hours altogether, two days a week, to help Anthony Gonzalez, <laughs> a rookie wide receiver, get ready for training camp. This is a three-time MVP. No one ever knew that. He didn't ask the coaches, didn't talk about it, just did it on his own because he loved football and he wanted to get his teammates ready to go. That's unbelievable. I, I never and that's heard, Peyton I Manning. That's that Peyton Manning in a nutshell. Yeah. That's why he was great. Man. I mean, I, I'd always heard he was at Zionsville or some high school even before guys were introduced yep. to the – you know what I mean? That kind of thing. I never yeah. heard that story. Yeah, no, he would do that, but Anthony couldn't come. The rest of the guys, there, you know, yeah, I don't know where they crazy. threw. Uh, you know, he had Reggie Wayne and those guys and Marcus Pollard, and they throw at Zionsville or wherever – but Anthony couldn't come and be part of that. So Peyton said, you know what? I'm going to drive and get him ready the same way. That's the love that's of the, the most game. Amazing that's the story. focus. Uh, and that's, that's what makes greatness. Coach, an update. You were great with our bikes program. It's still going. We're getting ready to give a bunch of bikes away on the 26th of September, getting ready to give probably 100 more bikes away around Christmas. You promoting it absolutely helped us. I want to let you know that. Second thing, who do I call? 
Who do I email? We got to get the clicker back, coach. We got to get the damn clicker back, coach. <laughs> we got to get it back. Uh, yeah. Hit hit up Sam Flood at NBC and tell him you need to get the clicker <laughs> back and then keep me posted on the, the Christmas bikes. My wife and I want to donate again. Thank you, sir. Thanks, coach. All right. Always good to be with you, Dan. Great talking to you too, coach. That's a great coach, Tony Dungy. I'm serious about it. When he was on at halftime or before a game and he had the clicker and he was teaching football, I'm telling you, it's the best segment on football television. Maybe the best segment on television, period. I, you know, it was, I would sit there and go, oh, yeah, yeah, I get that. Okay, and now I'm going to look for that now. And that does not, as you guys know, that does not happen. Great get. Uh, Coach Dungy is always fantastic.